Okay, today's June 19th, 2022, and it's Father's Day. So I thought we'd talk a little bit about fathers and especially the importance of fathers. And I'm Reverend Walter Frank, pastor of Family Church of San Diego. Our larger, larger worldwide organization is Family Federation for World Peace and Unification. Because we're all one, we're all one family, really, basically. Are you looking for something, John? He's going to turn on the lights, so that's all right. Okay. This is from our Divine Principle book on Principle of Creation. It's about growth. One thing we understand about everything in the universe, including the universe itself, is that everything grows. All animals grow, all cells grow, all insects grow, all plants grow. The universe grows. It took a long time to grow the earth. Whether you believe it's six days or six billion years, it still takes time to grow. And especially human beings need to grow. Our physical body, before, look, before 100 years ago, we didn't really even know what our physical body needed to grow. We didn't know there was proteins. We didn't know there was essential fatty acids. We didn't know there was vitamins. We didn't know the secret of carbohydrates. We didn't know those things. People just ate things they found and wondered why they were sick or had beriberi or things like that. But more importantly, we, we believe that we have a spirit and a body. And our body needs certain elements to grow. For example, we need, as I mentioned, proteins, fats, essential amino acids, things like that. We need to know what those are and ingest them in the right amounts to be healthy and to be strong and, and to live a long life. And same thing with our spirit. We need to understand the elements that makes our spirit grow, our emotions grow to maturity, our willpower to grow, our affection, our ability to love others. All these things are, are parts of ourself that can grow or cannot grow. And to grow, we need to add the essential elements that we call life elements of love and truth. So for the growth and perfection of the spirit man, it needs nourishment, positive nutrients and negative uh, nutrients. The positive nutrients are the life elements from God, essentially and basically God's love. That's why knowing and understand God exists is so important. That's why knowing that the air we breathe, the food we eat, all the things we have aren't just things. They're actually acts of God's love to take care of us. God as a parent created a planet, an earth, that's full of vitality for us physically and full of vitality for us spiritually. God's love. And, and importantly for us, we call ourselves Family Church because this is like the parental love which children need to grow into maturity. We need to receive love as children to grow to emotional, intellectual, and uh, willpower maturity. However, unfortunately, and this is the reality of the evil world we live in, through the fall, man left God's realm of love and fell into the dominion of evil where he could not receive God's love. And that's why. Many times we wander, around, we wander around the earth wondering who we are, what we should be doing, why doesn't anybody love me, how do I find love, we need love but can't find it, people are lost so therefore do drugs or whatever in the world they do, or at least get a hobby, right? So fallen man's spirit, spirit man cannot receive God's life elements and therefore cannot grow to perfection. So the whole point of our organization is how do we receive God's life elements and be able to grow to meet God, to become one with God, right? Matthew 5, 48, you should become perfect as your Heavenly Father is perfect. God tells us to do it. Jesus commands us to do that. And we're trying to explain how you do that. Fallen man must be restored to the original dominion of God's love by the Messiah through his faith and fulfillment of responsibility. So let's look. So our church is called Family Federation for World Peace and Unification because we believe family is the essence of God's love, the most important element of God's love on the earth. It's true, you can see nature and feel God's love. Many people go to nature and feel God's love. Remember last week I talked about John Muir. He went to the mountains, Yosemite, and think, this is, I feel God's love here. This is better than going to church is being in nature. We agree with that. But parents 
are better than being in nature. We say familyism, of course, begins with parents, a father and a mother. We are reborn through Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit, which is essentially like a father and mother. We are reborn into God's heavenly lineage. And it's not like we're, what should I say, uh, what? Rebirth. Jesus talks about rebirth because it's an act of the family. It's a biological act of growing up. Right? So Jesus' title from Isaiah 9, 6 is our eternal father. He has four main titles. One of them is eternal father, meaning it's a, a familial relationship. Father and son, fathers and children, fathers and daughters. And Jesus explained that God is our true father, our heavenly father, right? He called God Abba, father, like it's more closer, Abba is closer to daddy or a warm, sentimental type, uh, something you call your father than just father. And so that should be our relationship. Further, Reverend Mrs. Moon have explained that God is our true parent. And we are created, and more importantly, we're created in the image of God. Male, male and female, he created them. And the time is coming when we will grow to be true parents we were created to be. So ourselves, we ideally, humans on earth, grow to become true parents who then raise true children. Right? Right? We believe that this is a generational issue we're dealing with and should happen sometime soon. For, and, by the way, Christianity gives us a kind of ideal image of what a father is like. I thought I, I'd share some of those things because there's many people who are against fatherhood. Right? Feminists don't like the idea of father. They think masculinity is toxic, only evil continually, etc., etc. But we think it's not true. Masculinity is ideal of God, and if we use it correctly, like you use any tool correctly, it produces good things and good works. So this is this is Mark ten thirteen. Then they brought little children to him, Jesus, that he might touch them. So parents heard about Jesus' healing power and love and his ability to love people. The parents brought little children to him that he might touch them, but the disciples rebuked those who brought them. We don't know why. Were they tired? Was it lunchtime? We don't know why. <coughs> but the disciples rebuked those who brought them, and then Jesus saw it. He was greatly displeased and said to them, No! Let the little children come to me and do not forbid them. For of such is the kingdom of God. Assuredly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will by no means enter it, meaning you must be reborn through Jesus and the Holy Spirit, or you can't get there from here. And he took them up in his arms and his hands, uh, laid his hands on them and blessed them, touched them, hugged them, kissed them, prayed for them. Jesus, the eternal father, this is how he behaves towards little kids. He doesn't spank them, doesn't pinch them on the neck, doesn't, right, doesn't tell them, be quiet, you naughty kids, you doesn't do any of those things. He hugs them, loves them, touches them, kisses them, heals them and blesses them. So we think that's the ideal picture of what a father should be like. I thought I'll continue on that vein. Christian cultural sphere built up an image of what a good father is like. Let me explain that to you. This is from 1 Timothy. In 1 Timothy, what the story is, Timothy is St. Paul's spiritual son. <coughs> he he uh, originally witnessed to him raised him up, and also the church at Ephesus is his church. He founded Ephesus. So he's sending Timothy to Ephesus to be the leader of that church, right? His own spiritual son and his own church that he founded. So then he's giving him advice. He says, here is a trustworthy saying, Timothy. Whoever aspires to be a bishop desires a noble task. Now the overseer is to be above reproach. First of all things, Faithful to his wife. That's number one. Faithful to his wife. And by the way, that's why Martin Luther said uh, clergy should get married. Comes from Timothy 1. Two, should be temperate. That is not extremes. Not crazy, yelling, not too weak, not too timid. He should be self-controlled. He should be respectable. He should be hospitable. That is hospitable meaning he's nice to people, we get the word hospital from hospitable because that's where you go to get healed and uh, kindness, 
uh, also able to teach. By the way, able to teach is one, two, three, four, five, the seventh on the list, right? Able to teach is good. Being faithful to your wife is better. If you've got to prioritize it. Listen to this one. Not given to drunkenness. Because being drunk, if you're a pastor and you're drunk, it's hard to give a good sermon. It really is hard. I haven't tried it. I just can understand from St. Paul, don't do that. But this is one of the reasons, this is one of the reasons feminists and other groups don't like masculinity. Alcoholism and other kinds of abusive behaviors, uh, not being hospitable, not being respectable, not being self-controlled, being controlled by drugs or other influences is the reason why some people really dislike uh, masculinity. And they say, they say masculinity is toxic. That's why. So if you, if you disobey Paul, if you disobey Jesus, and you're not nice to kids, you don't hold them and kiss them and bless them, then people will reject the whole idea of you being a parent or a father. And that's what we have to deal with in our society. How do we, how do we overcome these things? Paul continues, not violent, but gentle. Where do you learn that from? Jesus. Jesus was gentle with little kids. Bring your little kids to me and I'll be nice to them. I'll hold them and touch them and kiss them. That's what a father is supposed to look like. Not quarrelsome. I'm not quarrelsome. Right, honey? I never quarrel. Never. <laughs> not a lover of money. Do you know why? Because it takes a lot of money to raise your kids. If you want all the money for yourself, it's not going to work for your hobbies. It won't work. He must manage his own family well and see that his children obey him and he must do so in a manner worthy of full respect. So if you get your kids to obey you because you whipped the snot out of them, sorry, that's not worthy of respect. They should love you and respect you because you love them. That's why. That's why. That, and that's what we're trying to create at Family Church universally, right? Oh, if anyone does not know how to manage his own family, how can he take care of God's church? Makes sense to me. He must also have a good reputation with outsiders so that he will not fall into disgrace and into the devil's trap. So, uh, so have a respectable business or whatever you do. Okay, so here's what we think. Father's Day, honoring fathers is about the men who choose, of his, who chooses of his own free will to remain loyal to one wife. If you choose to remain loyal to one wife, God bless you. That's what God likes. That's what God wants to see. That's what God approves of. Jesus will visit you. Who chooses to abstain from drugs and alcohol. Right? The man who freely says, no, I don't want to be drunk. I want to take care of my kids. I'd rather take my kids to Disneyland or wherever and, and then spend money on alcohol or whatever. Right? Who chooses to be a good parent, to be gentle and temperate and not angry and hostile. Who chooses gentleness over anger and upsetness, who chooses to sacrifice his life for the sake of his family. We would oftentimes give the example of father, the good, a good example of a father is like a candle. Right? A candle, you have to burn the candle up. While it gives light to your room, the candle is eventually burning itself out. That's why as fathers we get older, fatter, weaker looking, because we're burning ourselves out to take care of the rest of the family bald or two. We lose our hair in this great effort to love our children. It's incredible. What a sacrifice. Okay, so this is, this is an important part. So this is also about biology, right? So we say God is one, right? That's an that's a important element. We view God. God is one. Also, we believe there's one universe, there's one uh, earth, etc. One sun, but that God is one has masculinity and femininity in the original God. And that's why we see both men and women. We see both female and male. That's why we see electrons and protons. That's why everything on earth is positive and negative, mental and physical. And so that God made them male and female. And this is what parents look like. And this is what uh, origination of human beings looks like. So father... When we talk about fathers and mothers, when we talk about mothers, 
fathers have 46 chromosomes, mothers have 46 chromosomes. <coughs> That's why we're, we're a different species than any other species. And no, we are not 98% similar DNA to a chimpanzee. That's completely erroneous. Anyhow, so in order to have a child, father donates 23 pairs of chromosomes, mother donates 23 pairs of chromosomes, so that a child has the two shall become one flesh, and that's where the sharing happens, becoming one flesh. And then what you get is 23 chromosomes from, from the man and sperm, and 23 chromosomes from the mother and the egg, and then you get 46 chromosomes in the baby, and that's what creates a human being. Hmm. Right? And we say this is the only way to create a human being, that God made, Genesis 1.27, that God made them in the image of God, male and female, so that will do what? come together in one flesh and create beautiful children that God will love, right? We think the most holy of all things on the earth are little children, from Jesus' perspective. That's the most holy. How do you get there? You need to have a, a mother and a father. So it looks like this. So we say there's a biological importance of fathers. It just isn't us teaching this. It just isn't just biblical uh, knowledge. It's also biological knowledge. So let's examine this. Gender diversity is in our genes and must be in our genes. Courts and legislatures can change legal definitions, but they cannot alter biology or psychology. For example, in the late 1970s, Azim Sorani won the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine while he tried to create new life using two sets of genes from only a mother or a father. Mm. Right? So we know it takes 46 chromosomes. But he thought, I'll do an experiment where I take 23 chromosomes from the mother, take 23 chromosomes out of another cell, and add them to the original egg cell. Mm. What happened? Eggs died. They could not grow. The C. Everything then known about genetics suggested that with the right number of chromosomes, life would develop normally, even if all of its genetic material came from only a female or a male. That's what many people think. It's a myth. It's not true. Right? They think, wow, we don't need men anymore. But the eggs with only the mother's genes <coughs> cannot survive. A similar fate met the eggs implanted with two sets of father's genes also cannot survive. It's essential that an egg have both masculine and feminine chromosomes in order for it to grow into a human being. Because that's the nature of the universe we come from. So here's what it looked like. He tried to add 23 pairs of female to 23 pairs of female, but every experiment, every egg died. Could not, cannot be. It doesn't work. Nobody, and they don't know why exactly, except that we believe there's an original cause of the universe. Uh, the essential need for both the mother and father to provide genetic material for survival parallels what social science tells us about the importance of mother, mothers and fathers in children's development. A science reporter, Paul Rayburn, described Sarani dis discovered that mothers and fathers each contributed something in their genes that was critical to sustaining life. These paternal and maternal genes appeared completely indistinguishable in every way, yet expressed themselves differently depending on whether they come, came from the mother or the father, and both were essential for the survival of the egg. So, right, you don't read about this in newspapers. We think that any, you can do anything, but it's not true. There's only a man and woman necessary for any child to be born. It's essential science and biology. Guy want, wins the Nobel Prize, but nobody reports about it, right? Because it's weird social, cultural mythology. Fathers and mothers bring similar, even indistinguishable capacities that enable a healthy child development. But like the complementarity of the left and the right halves of the brain, they also bring distinct capacities that provide complementary, irreplaceable contributions to children's healthy development. So, we should celebrate Father's Day, right? Because fathers are essential. They're biologically essential and divinely essential. So let's begin to talk about the divine essentiality of fatherhood. This is from uh, Reverend Moon's speech, God's Ideal Family and the Kingdom of the peaceful ideal world. <coughs> so here's his teaching on the or search of the origin of the universe. And this is why I like Reverend Moon. He says, thus it is my great honor to share with you my lifelong advocacy for world peace and true family values. 
In this world, there are two kinds of human beings, men and women. Again, agreeing with the Nobel Prize winner, there's two kinds, right? So, we, I, I showed you this. What is marriage and why is marriage important? So we're a family church. We strongly believe in the sacrament and sanctity of the blessing of marriage. Right? So here's uh, why. Marriage is important because it is the road to finding love, but not just love, true love. People who just date and meet people, that rarely ends up in true love. And it ends up in a lot of broken hearts, a lot of depression, a lot of misery. But if you can be a person who, like St. Paul suggested, remains faithful to one wife, no matter what, actually social scientists discover that that is a much happier. So for example, they studied couples who thought they were going to divorce, they arguing, quarreling, etc., etc., failing to listen to Jesus. Anyway, they're arguing, quarreling, and they, but then they decided not to divorce. They said, okay, we're going to work on our marriage. Those people five or ten years later are much, much, much happier than people who actually got divorced. Did you know that? And people who actually got divorced are suffering now from depression, economic problems, etc., etc. So, Marriage is a, is a way, a road of finding true love. It is a road to creating life. Again, we know it takes a, a man or a woman to create life, but more than that, to nurture life, it takes a lifelong commitment of man to woman, woman to man, and parents to children. It is not only the road to creating life, it is a road where the life of a man and woman unite into one. It is a place where a man's lineage combines with a woman's lineage. History emerges through marriage, and from marriage, nations appear, and an ideal world begins. Without marriage, there is no meaning to the existence of individuals, nations, and an ideal world. This is the formula for real world peace. Men and women must become absolutely one. Parents and children must become absolutely one with God, love God, and live and die with God. I think those are the most some of the most important words I've read or read to you. Understanding the love of God is so essential to us being alive human beings. To be alive means you're in love. Love and life. If you don't, if nobody loves you, are you really happy? I don't know anybody who's really happy if nobody loves you. But when people love you, then you get incredibly happy, right? Wow, life is great. Life is rainbows and butterflies. And when you die, if you live this way, and when you die and go to the spirit world, that's the place called heaven. Because if, if you have the ability to create a family of true love, you, you're, you receive God's greatest blessing to you. Okay, let's talk about fathers and the importance of fatherhood on an emotional level. Prior to the 1960s and 70s, many behavioral scientists assumed that fathers were relatively unimportant to their children's healthy development, the authors note. For example, they should just go to work, bring home money, pay the rent, and then, you know, go to sleep or watch television or whatever. It's not true. It's really not true. But, but again, remember, a hundred years ago, we didn't know what proteins were. A hundred years ago, we didn't know what vitamins were. People were still getting sick because they didn't even know what vitamins were. A hundred years ago, we, don't know, we didn't know the importance of fathers. And I will, and I will agree with that. We, nobody knew, right? Jesus and, divine, Je oops, sorry, Jesus and divine principle have always explained the importance of Father's love. That's why Jesus the Savior says, I'm your Father. Fatherhood is so essential to love and divine nature and to be adopted back and to know God. Right? So we say, well, the Bible says God is love. So what does that mean to us? If God is love, knowing God is to love and be able to love others. Right? We are made in the image of God, so we also are made of love, but because of the fall of man, we don't know it. We don't know how to release the love in our heart. We don't know how to practice the love we were born to create. And so that's why we have to have churches and religions begin to teach us how to, how to let that love out into our family. Okay, so, however, in an article, The Importance... A Father Love, History and Contemporary Evidence, published in December 2001, issue of Rio General Psychology, Ronan Ven Veneziano examined nearly 100 studies that explore the effect of parenting on children's behavior. The studies published between 1949 and 2001 are some of the few that deal with fathers. So the idea was, since a child comes out of the mother's body, 
mothers are the only ones who have the ability to feed a baby, then mothers must be more important than a father. That's what they used to think. Mm -hmm. So fathers were, were superfluous. That's why in the United States and Europe, when there was a divorce, they would 100% of the time, unless the mother was an absolute drug addict or in jail, give custody to the mother, right? Because that's what they thought. That's why that took place in public thought, but it's not true. Consider what social science research reveals about how mothers and fathers distinctly influence children's social and emotional development. That is this, mothers are biologically primed. Biologically primed. That means it happens without them thinking about it. If a mother has a baby, she wants to hug, touch, love, feed that baby. It's natural, right? to provide nurturing oriented toward creating a strong attachment relationship. Mothers want to hold the baby. Mother, baby is taken away. Mothers feel nervous. Oh, where's my baby? I must see, touch, feel, smell my baby. I must be with my baby, right? <clears throat> Dramatic increases in oxytocin and oxytocin receptors during the process of giving birth and caring for infants act like a switch in mothers turning on maternal behaviors. So we say that this is from creation. We are created in the image of God to love and so our body is created, designed to be able to love children once they're born. That it's natural. However, it's not automatic, right? New moms find themselves expressing positive feelings, affectionately touching and gazing at the influence and engaging in motherese, which is like goo goo gaga, baby woo woo, vocalizations. Infants levels of oxytocin parallel their mothers producing feelings of calm and well-being that similarly bond mother and offspring. This is what we, we learn about this in the Bible, but now social scientists know that those things Jesus taught us are true. Popular myths of fatherhood. At the very most, fathers were thought to be peripheral to the job of parenting because children spent most of their time with their mothers. Some even argue that fathers have no biological aptitude for child care. The women were said to be genetically endowed for it. But it's not, again, it's not true. Fathers are genetically endowed from the beginning of creation to be good fathers. The truth. Fathers experience significant physiological changes that prime them for bonding as well. Right? But the same hormones elicit different types of responses. Instead of inviting security-inducing behaviors, father's levels of oxytocin are associated with stimulatory behaviors like tickling and bouncing. So fathers naturally, when they hold the baby, tickle, tickle baby's neck. Like that, right? And kids usually laugh when that happens, right? This suggests a biological foundation for what we observe all around us. So we say it's in your biology. You were created by God, designed by God, to tuck, tickle and play with babies and have fun with them. That's me, right? We say this biological foundation is designed by God. Who else would design it? Who else would design it? While mothers are more likely to coo and cuddle their infants, fathers are more likely to tickle and toss babies around. So don't worry. So mothers, you should understand this. This is important. This is not fathers being crazy. This is not fathers being not prepared to be a, a good father. This is prepared by God for a different type of stimulation to children, which is also essential to children, children's lives. Watch, you'll see. These differences foreshadow more extensive complementary patterns exhibited across children's development, which are essential for the well-being of the child, which you'll see in a second. According to the authors, the studies they examined can be divided into six categories. Several studies look only at the influence of father love, typically as it relates to gender role development or father development. The first set of studies concludes that father love, or lack of it, is just as important as mother love in relation to personality and psych psychological adjustment problems, conduct problems, cognitive and academic performance issues, mental illness and substance abuse. Fathers are essential. If your children are to grow well, be stimulated uh, intellectually, and I'll show you how that happens in a minute. According to the third set of studies, father love is a soul, is a soul significant predictor of specific outcomes in the broad categories of personality and psychological adjustment problems, conduct and delinquency problems, and substance abuse. 
There's a gigantic problem in our culture and society today that people do not know the real value of biological parents, especially the value of fatherhood, right? And uh, uh, some of this may be due in part to the discipline style of fathers. Fathers intervene to discipline less often than mothers, but when they do, they exhibit more firmness and predictability. In contrast, mothers use more reasoning and flexibility. Can the point is, how fathers do it is different than mothers, but it's the single most important element. Remember Clayton Two Bears, who I mentioned we're praying for? Yes. He was a spiritual advisor to uh, Native American, uh, Native Americans in penitentiary for oh, committing yes. crimes. When, when I showed him, when he showed him this, he said, absolutely. He said, look, I deal with all with criminals in jail. Uh, drug addicts, criminals, killers, murderers, etc., etc. He said the single most common factor with those criminals is that they love their mothers, right? You cannot go to jail and say your mother wears combat. You cannot do, they will kill you. But that they didn't have fathers. They didn't know their fathers, or their fathers were abusive, or their fathers were alcoholics, or their fathers were drug addicts, or their fathers themselves were in prison. And that's how those young men got there. Right? This is a gigantic social children. For example, we're, we're doing, uh, uh, because of the recent gun violence we've seen, our church is doing, this is in Chicago, Stopping the Crime and Violence in America. Uh, Wednesday, they did this one, they're going to be in, the next one is going to be this. But what we're talking about, uh, Reverend Jenkins, Reverend Abraham Rouse, who's a certified family planning counselor, Reverend Zagri Oliver, is preaching this word. And that is that this, is the, this will be uh, June 8th. Mr. Anthony Malay, president of Senior Consulting, MIA Global Security. His, his point is this, number one, that it's the breakdown of the family which is causing so much gun violence in America. It's not guns. We've always had guns. We had very little violence like we have now, but the big problem is we have family breakdown with children, especially young men, growing out without the discipline, love, kindness, uh, uh, temperance, all, the, uh, uh, all those things that fathers bring to a child's growth. And because they don't have those things, they feel lost and alone and, they're, and they do other bad things. It gets them into a huge amount of trouble. Uh, number two, fatherless homes. <coughs> Fatherless homes are the biggest reason we have a giant crime wave in America. Mm. Number two, three, is drugs and alcohol, drug and alcohol abuse. So these are, are, are mostly Christian brothers and sisters trying to teach how do we solve these gun problems in America. It's not the guns, right? There's still, what, 10, 12,000 people every year killed by drunk drivers. Mm. It's not the cars. It isn't the cars. You shouldn't get rid of all the cars. It's not the cars, it's drunk driving that's the problem. It's the behavior of drunk driving. So, same thing. According to a recent study, young men with self, high self-esteem shared some common childhood influences. There were three major characteristics of their families. Number one, high esteem group was clearly more loved and appreciated at home than the low esteem group. So if you come home from school and your dad says hi and plays games with you and you have a nice dinner and you have a good time, you're probably going to be in the high esteem group. You're probably going to do well in life. Two, the high esteem group came from homes where parents had been significantly more strict in their approach to discipline. Did you know that? Not mean, not crazy, not over crazy, not whipping and beating, but who said, look, there are rules in our home and you obey those rules. This is essential. And listen to this one, number third. So, on the other hand, it says, fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in training and instruction of the Lord. Do it nicely with love. But listen to this one. By contrast, the parents of low esteem had created insecurity and dependence through their permissiveness. When you tell your kids, well, I, we don't really care what you do. We don't really care who you talk to. We don't really care how much time you spend on your cell phone. We don't really care who you're seeing on Facebook. We don't really care. Then it tells the children, you don't care about me. Because they feel not cared for or loved, then they feel unloved. And when people don't feel loved, they don't do well in life. Right? Their children were more likely to feel that the rules were not enforced because no one cared enough to get involved in their life. So if your parents are limiting your telephone time and limiting your computer time and limiting this or that, limiting who you go to, and say, no, you cannot go to the mall with your friends, 
Mm. Say, thank you very much, Mom and Dad. Thank you very much. <clears throat> the homes of theory number three, the homes of high self-esteem group were also characterized by democracy and openness. Once the boundaries were established, there was freedom for individual personalities to grow and develop. Thus, the overall atmosphere is marked by acceptance and emotional safety. And emotional safety. Okay, this is the big one, and this is the one I like the most, because nobody understands this. Most significantly, fathers influence children's social and relation capacity through playing with them, right? Sometimes mothers think you're just wasting time, you're just playing games with your kids, you're just playing. But this is a biological necessity for children's upbringing. Compared to mothers, fathers are much more likely to interact through play. And that play is strongly predictive of the quality of children's peer relationships. In repeated studies, fathers who spent more time in positive play with their children had children with the highest peer ratings and being able to relate to friends and family and not be a knucklehead. When fathers were more responsive, patient, playful, and less coercive in their play, children showed less aggressiveness and more pure competence and they were better liked. This is why Children, especially young men with fathers who play with them, talk to them, work with them, do all kinds of things with them, those children don't land up in the penitentiary. Right? And let's, I'm just going to talk about play for just a second. Why do animals play? In fact, animals play is something we all know. Due to its complexity, play is considered an activity almost exclusive of mammals, mainly as a consequence of major development to their nervous system in contrast with other organisms. The main benefit of social play, the acquirement of abilities and behaviors that will be of major importance during adulthood. So dogs learn how to play, how to hunt. But do you notice that dogs, even though they have really sharp teeth, never actually hurt each other? There's a biological limit. They never actually bite each other and draw blood. I love dogs. Okay, listen to this. Play. This is a neural system of normal human brain at birth. This is at age six. You see tr tremendous increase in, uh, in neurons and uh, synapses. Okay, this is the nerves uh, in brain of an animal living in a bear cage. He never gets to play. This animal never gets to play. This animal, this is the brain of an animal with other animals and toys to play with. So the importance of play of parents, especially fathers, playing with their children will, will make a gigantic difference in how intelligent how well off they are, how well they're doing in life. It's so important. So fathers, please play with your kids, right? At, as one report noted, roughhousing with dad appears to teach children, teach children how to deal with aggressive impulses and physical contact without losing control of their emotions. Through play, fathers help children learn how to temper and channel emotions in a positive, interactive way and gain confidence in their ability to do so. As children age, fathers focus less on physical play and engage in more pure like verbal play in the form of sarcasm and humor. Hey. It's called, there's a whole genre on the internet called dad humor. Do you know why that exists? Because God put it in your brain so that you would have fun with your kids. Don't you love that, kids? Yay, sarcasm and humor, that's a good thing? Yes, it is. You mean dad jokes and puns are scientifically based and beneficial? Yes, they are. Wow, who would have thought that? See, nobody knows that because they don't go read science books on mental health and things like that. Pure like verbal play allows a father to tease and joke with a child within the safety of the father-child relationship, thus strengthening children's sense of identity and social confidence. That makes sense? Children learn how to deal with uh, a funny joke or teasing without getting crazy. Ideally, ideally. While mothers consistently build self-understanding, fathers consistently build social relationship understanding. God bless them. That's why we have Father's Day. God bless those fathers. Who knew they were doing God's will all this time? We thought they were just being funny. Wow, right? Fathers are so great. I'm sure that's what you're thinking right now. Fathers are so great. I bet you're anxious to hear some dad humor right now. No, no, no we're not going to do that. Sorry. So we say... We say fatherhood is actually created by God because the benefits of fathers to children are so great. They're children without fathers. No father without a child is actually happy about that. Fatherless children want to be in a family. 
motherless children want to have a mother. Believe me, I was in that situation and I always wanted to have a, a fab sub. So I, we created one with my beautiful wife, Suyapa. And so we have, we, are, we have built in designs by God to accomplish our task. To accomplish our task. It's natural to be a parent, but listen to this. It's not automatic. That's why we have some parents that didn't do well. It's not automatic. We say, essentially, you have to learn to be a parent. You have to release that natural ability to love your children. You have to let it release it. And by the way, support of the mother is really important, right? The Gospels, by the way, if you struggle with your own father at some time, not impossible, it's po quite possible. Uh, if you struggle with your kids at some time, the Gospels are adamant in the view of forgiveness and reconciliation between parents and children. It's essential, important quality of life to improve your life if you can reconcile with your parent if you were not close to them there. I had that opportunity with my dad and we became great friends. I loved him and he became a great grandfather, a wonderful grandfather to our children. We are called blessed couples because our relationship is sanctified by God. And God wants to be a part of your relationship. Like everyone said, God wants to be a part of your relationship. The ideal of creation is God in your family, being with you, praying together, studying together, playing together, having dinner together. We say food is love. Having dinner with your family. By the way, when they studied uh, uh, A-plus students in college, the several singularities, where they come from religious families. Number two, they all had dinner together with their families. Mom, mom and dad, brothers and sisters, had a regular dinner time. And that was so, such a powerful effect on children that they could tell by grades in university which ones had those families or not. <clears throat> Prayer for reconciliation is the important element. If you have estranged from a parent or estranged from family, prayer to figure out how to heal that estrangement is really important and necessary to do on earth. So let's be grateful to our fathers today. Let's bless them. God bless you for coming. We have a great lunch prepared and a nice cake. And let's have a happy day. Thank you very much. Amen.